Good morning, all. Thank you very much. Uh, now, a couple of notices uh, for you. Yesterday, we began with that very moving commemoration. There may be some of you who were not here, or some who were here but would have wanted to add their message to it. If you do, uh, you can go to the chapel uh, where the, the white uh, container of all the messages is. There are spare bottles, and you have an opportunity to add your message if you want. And I've been asked to remind you that if you want to visit the campaigner's room, it's just next to, near to, the chapel. And indeed, if you feel moved and troubled at all, there is confidential support available in a room just next to that. So those are the notices. This morning, we have the pleasure of listening first to Aidan O'Neill QC on behalf uh, of those uh, largely Scots uh, represented by Thompsons. Uh, he will take uh, until uh, 11 o'clock or thereabouts. We, we may add a couple of minutes to that because we started uh, a little late. Uh, and I'd ask those who have to speak to try to keep to, to timings if they can. It's to give everyone uh, the best that we can do in terms of fair shares and the time available. Uh, and he will be followed by, uh, at 11 o'clock by Della Rhinus Hirsch, the first of our uh, unrepresented core participants. Enough from me, uh, I want to listen to what uh, uh, Aidan O'Neill has to, to say. Thank you very much, uh, Chair. Uh, I'm uh, Aidan O'Neill, and I appear along with uh, my learned friends, Council uh, Jamie Dawson uh, and Kirsten Chauvel, on behalf of almost 250 core participants who are infected and affected clients represented before the inquiry uh, by Thompson's. We've prepared a written opening statement, which is fairly long, uh, it has to be said, uh, but it is because it's been prepared in a participatory manner as much as possible, so that what's being said is being said by uh, as much as on behalf of uh, those whom we have the privilege to represent. Uh, this written statement is, I think, being placed on the inquiry website and uh, is available to all uh, to read at the leisure. So what I would propose to do in this uh, hour or so that I have, and I really don't want to try your patience, is pick up some of the themes which we have set out uh, in that written uh, statement, um, but not necessarily uh, take everything uh, from it. So first of all, the very fact that we are being asked to give an opening statement is for us uh, a, shows a major difference from the manner in which the previous inquiry, which many of those whom I represent, uh, were involved in Scotland. That is the uh, Penrose uh, inquiry, where there was no opportunity uh, for any kind of opening statement, where, as I understand it, the only statement uh, from uh, the chair there uh, at the start was to uh, remind anyone present that money spent on the inquiry was money taken away from frontline NHS care. That is not an attitude uh, which we uh, think is being repeated here. We are sure it will not be. We uh, are hopeful that this inquiry will be able to properly and fully uh, answer the so many questions which have been raised uh, by those whom we represent 
those questions which for us were left unanswered uh, by our experience in the Penrose Inquiry. The Penrose Inquiry and our experience in it, in a sense, is still useful and, and will come on and, and set out why, uh, because some of the evidence uh, which uh, will be relevant to this inquiry was heard and discussed uh, there. So it's not just individuals whom I represent, but also the charities, Hemophilia Scotland and the Scottish Infected Blood Forum. They've campaigned for many years in seeking to represent the interests and ensure respect for basic rights. It's the basic rights of the infected and affected which have not uh, been uh, respected uh, in the many years in which uh, you have had to live uh, through this uh, contaminated uh, blood disaster. We uh, represent uh, individuals uh, who have been inf infected and affected by all bloodborne pathogens, uh, hepatitis B and hepatitis C clearly, HIV, and we note that uh, variant CJD is also expressly mentioned uh, in the terms of reference. Our experience is that the injury and the deaths in many cases which have been suffered have resulted from wrongful acts on the part of those responsible for providing supplies of blood and blood products. So the inquiry is for us an exercise, first of all, clearly in establishing the truth of what happened, in bringing past and ongoing wrongs, past and ongoing wrongs. This is not something which is finished. Bring those wrongs to light, to learn the lessons from the disaster, to protect all patients who rely on the NHS for safe treatment. We want the inquiry to call those responsible for those past wrongs and failings to account. We want the inquiry to provide an opportunity for those who were responsible for those wrongs to acknowledge and accept responsibility for them, that what was done by them and or on their watch. We want the inquiry to be that space in which they can apologise fully and unreservedly and unequivocally for the harms which you have suffered. Now, I've spent uh, the past couple of weeks going around uh, different parts of Scotland meeting with some of the 250 or so people uh, I represent. So, as I say, this uh, statement is very much drafted uh, by them as much as by the lawyers. So I want to set out a few of the things which, uh, which I've learned uh, in that time. And it's been very much a learning experience for me. So first of all, I'll talk to you about the clients I represent and their experiences. Uh, much of it is familiar to you. The fact is it's unfamiliar to me, and that's the shocking part. You know what you've gone through and so much of the rest of society didn't know that. So my meeting uh, those clients, as I say, has been a revelation. And it is right and proper that it is your experience of the infected and affected which is being placed, in the words of the Chair, front and centre. You're physically front and centre. You will be, I hope, at all times and in all aspects of the manner in which the inquiry is run. It's the hearing and heeding of stories of the infected and affected. Only by doing that that the inquiry can properly conduct its business and fulfil the hopes and expectations which have been invested in it. As I say, I've been humbled by what I've heard by people whose lives have been blighted and burdened by the infection. I have heard the righteous anger. When I uh, appeared in Glasgow, one uh, woman said to me, tell them 
We're not grateful. We're angry. Tell them it's about bloody time. And it is. So much time has been lost in coming here. So much time has been stolen from those whose lives should have been otherwise. And it's also about time in the sense that who knows how much time any of us have before us. So there is clearly a desire, a wish, as the Chair has said, that the inquiry is done with all due deliberate speed, that it not be rushed, but it be done efficiently and thoroughly and properly, but there not be undue delays uh, built into matters, because time is one thing uh, that we've spent too much of on this and don't have very much left. So I'm preaching, as it were, <laughs> Uh, to the converted, you know your stories. I don't have to tell you uh, what it's uh, been like and the variety of experiences uh, which you have uh, undergone. The fact that people from all walks of life, all social classes, all background, all ages have been affected and infected. But there are some common themes from that diversity. It is one common theme is that the, everyone has placed their trust, put themselves in the hands of health professionals when they needed their help, when they were at their most vulnerable. They trusted the doctors to whom they turned. They trusted their medical expertise. They trusted they would get the best help and care available. They presumed they would only be treated with safe products and therapies and they thought that the government would ensure that all those uh, trusts were fulfilled. Instead of this, uh, people who attended and sought uh, health care uh, came out not healthier, not cured, but instead crucially weakened in so many ways. Their health, in many cases, fundamentally, permanently, and irretrievably compromised, left with threatening diseases, left with therapies and treatments for those diseases and conditions which in some ways felt even worse than the, therapy, than the conditions which they were uh, left with, left with uh, subject to debilitating and sometimes experimental and untried therapies that left them permanently weakened and not even clear of some of the viruses. That has left many with a sense of their faith in the system shattered and a feeling then that that faith has not been restored because what they've been faced with has been stonewalling, secrecy, invasion, evasiveness about the condition, a lack of candor. And people have been left fearful. Their lives, in many cases, have been dogged by depression about uh, their present lives and anxiety about the future. People have lived and died in the shadow of infection. The lives that were left to them were not the lives they were supposed to lead. Those lives were stolen from them. And as I say, what people have told me is what they want is answers. They want matters to be uncovered. They want acknowledgement of what happened uh, to them. And we are very encouraged uh, from the, the opening of this inquiry that all those promises have been made. And my task, which I've been asked to do in some ways, is to hold the inquiry to account, to make sure that it lives up to those uh, hopes and expectations which have been invested uh, in it. We are, after all, as was said by another one, uh, another person in my representative meeting, 
We are core participants. The clues in the name. Those whom I represent are ready and willing to participate in the process. They expect to be able to do so. They expect to be fully uh, participating. Their experience in the Penrose inquiry uh, has to be that only a very few uh, of the infected and affected were allowed to be designated as core participants, but even there, they were sidelined, and that was their feeling at least. And the feeling was that that inquiry was captured by the medical establishment and was biased against hearing the voices of patients and their families. And the result was that Penrose, rather than being uh, giving the possibility of, of, of being able to live through and some kind of closure on matters, simply added to that sense of, of frustration, of rejection, of loss. We don't want this inquiry to be, end up with that similar loss of hope. So that means, uh, sir, if I may, that one of the main issues which has come out in the meetings I've had is the need to investigate and the ex expose the extent of uh, cover-up. Now, cover-up sounds like uh, conspiracy theories uh, writ large. The number of people who have spoken to me independently have come up with such similar stories of medical records that disappeared, of medical records apparently filleted through so that uh, evidence or record of, of actual treatment has gone. Now, uh, if it happened in one case, one would think it was incompetence or just lack of proper systems for uh, retaining records. But it's happened in so many cases, and we want to know why. How has that happened? Because the problem is, with a lack of trust, then one's faith is broken, and what's replaced by it are, is to an extent of the idea of conspiracy. Now, we don't want that, but we want to ensure that that issue is fully raised, aired, investigated, found upon. And people have looked in other parts of the world where uh, there have been criminal prosecutions. People have looked to, for example, Ireland, uh, where victims have been better treated in terms of financial compensation than they have to date uh, in uh, the United Kingdom. Although I have to say and admit that in Scotland, some of the provision financially has been better than in the rest of the United Kingdom. But just because it's better doesn't mean to say it's enough. So, the aims of the inquiry. There's a whole series of aims for public inquiries. The first one, obviously, is the issue of establishing the facts. And uh, as you, Chair, have, have said, that you intend uh, fully, fairly and fearlessly to investigate and expose matters uh, to public scrutiny, and we support you fully uh, in that. There are still a number of facts, a lot of facts, which need to be uncovered even after uh, the experience of the Penrose inquiry for us. But I, as I say, I think it's useful uh, for the inquiry to hear what we have, uh, what we think can be drawn from the Penrose inquiry uh, so that there isn't needless duplication of matters and that we can work on this uh, efficiency, uh, efficiently and uh, properly with all uh, due deliberate speed. The Penrose final report is a comprehensive work. Well, it's certainly very big. It's uh, five volumes, uh, almost 2,000 pages. The executive summary runs to 45 pages. Uh, there was an initial part of the inquiry with a preliminary report before anybody uh, among the infected or affected was involved going to 614 pages. Now, that has useful material. It can be mined usefully for some of the uh, chronology, some of the uh, factual matters in terms of medical practice uh, and, and the like. 
There's a, good, a lot of good scientific uh, information uh, contained uh, in that, uh, particularly and also a useful uh, account of some of the uncontentious scientific uh, uh, aspects. There's a useful uh, chapter on heat treatment of products, at least in Scotland. But we're, we feel that Penrose failed was that it didn't go further. It simply, it's a great one for setting out what it said, the facts were, without being, asking, well, why did those things happen? How can they be judged? Who was responsible for them? And we say that that is an essential part of this inquiry and that that judgment is not, as it appeared to be at the Penrose inquiry, simply about what was the general accepted medical practice in the 1970s and 80s? What did responsible doctors do? We are judging this with our standards, with what we know, with our standards in the present, to say that it may have been what they did, but that doesn't make it right. One of the issues we had with the Penrose inquiry also was the, was the language which was used in the report. It's not just what you say, it's how you say it. The language of the report ultimately was very careful, very measured, very lawyerly. Careful words like things were unfortunate or we found no evidence of failings or that certain uh, matters were noted. For example, uh, the fact that donors with a history of blood transfusion or haemophilia were excluded from donor sessions from May 1983. But there wasn't any analysis. There was no attribution of responsibility for matters which were noted. And then, uh, for example, the difference in treatment uh, about donor exclusion as between the east of Scotland and the west of Scotland was um, uh, referred to uh, the difference as being one being a less constructive approach. So again, passing comments, no analysis, no attribution of responsibility. And the possibility, for example, of the cessation of concentrate use for bleeding disorder patients in response to the growing knowledge that there was an issue and a threat of HIV, the idea that that could be stopped was dismissed as a minority view, rejected by a large body of informed opinion. The most it got to criticism was to say that some aspects could have been handled better. Now, that's not good enough, uh, frankly. Uh, one of the points of this inquiry, one of the aims of this inquiry, has to be, and is clear uh, from the terms of reference, to look at accountability to look at blame, to look at calling people who are responsible out for the responsibility. That's what justice requires. One other major aspect of inquiry, is, as we know from yesterday, is being heard as catharsis, is actually, for once, actually being listened to for your individual stories uh, to be there and at last uh, the subject of other people's attention, that you're no longer uh, in the shadows. And I have to say that I, I, uh, from yesterday's commemoration service and the words spoken that I think very much I can see that that is central in the way that this inquiry is, is going to proceed. There's also the issue of learning from events, clearly. Those whom I represent wish, are entitled, have a right to know why this all happened to them. They want to ensure uh, that this or anything like it should never happen again. They want to know what ought to have happened. And as I say, those whom I represent do not want doctors and other professionals to 
excuse their actions or hide behind the support of colleagues on the claim basis that they were just doing uh, what uh, accepted professional practice was at the time. Learning from events means applying the standards of today. And in so doing, one can perhaps begin to rebuild confidence, the confidence which so many of you have discovered to have been misplaced. That confidence has to be rebuilt. One of the issues which was raised yesterday of particular resonance for uh, those whom I represent uh, in coming to this issue of confidence uh, was the need or the, the failure on the part of the Scottish Government to participate in the inquiry as a core participant. Now, as I say, we have found the Penrose inquiry to be a lost opportunity and unfinished business. And it's against that background that we share the concerns which were expressed by Council to the inquiry at the failure of the Scottish Government uh, to apply to come in as a core participant. We discussed it yesterday. Some strong words were used about that. Uh, some people whom I represent, the, the, the 250 or so Scots, talked about cowardice. They talked about showing an appalling attitude, a shocking misjudgment and an embarrassing failure on the part of the Scottish Government, particularly when so many Scots or people from Scotland are core participants here. 250 is actually disproportionately large, particularly uh, given the clear and expressed dissatisfaction with the Penrose process and the Penrose uh, result, particularly against a background that, as we understand it, it was stated uh, by the previous Scottish Health Minister that the Scottish Government were going to be coming in in this inquiry. And now they seem to have changed their mind. And we don't know why. We formally call on the Scottish Government to reconsider its attitude to the inquiry and recognise its worth and importance to so many of us across these islands and come and join it as a core participant. There is much left that the Scottish Government, as with all the other governments represented and administrations, uh, can learn. As I say, this matter is not something which is confined to the past, uh, some unfortunate events happening in the 1970s and 80s before we ever had devolution, so what concern is it? The blood contamination disaster continues to be lived and experienced by all of you who are the survivors of it. So it's not just about uh, how you were treated in the past, it's about how you are treated today. And as part of the recommendations we'll be asking this inquiry to come up with is making, for example, available packages of financial assistance which fully recompense individuals and families for the losses they have suffered we will be asking for the establishment of proactive medical and nursing st uh, services staffed by health professionals fully trained in all the conditions associated uh, with the contamination uh, for the care of the physical health of the survivors. We will be asking for the provision of dedicated ongoing support services for the promotion of the emotional and social well-being and the protection of the mental health of the survivors because that the toll that that has taken has not been fully recognised. And all those are matters which will concern the Scottish Government, and therefore that is why we, should, we think it should be here. And we heard yesterday for the first time that there are two current ongoing police investigations in Scotland of which we know nothing. It would be, no, it would be nice, actually, uh, if we were kept informed. So... Come and join us. The terms of reference in this inquiry were, were referred to uh, by the Chair yesterday as having been, and, and by Council to inquiry, as having been uh, drawn up after consultation with so many of the infected and affected. And we endorse uh, them. We think that those terms of reference are all that we would wish. So we're thankful that we have been listened to uh, on that. 
Well, those terms of references are big issues. But none of them should be lost. They're all in there uh, for a reason. And we want them all to be fully and comprehensively covered and looked at. As I say, one of the issues uh, is cover-up, which wasn't looked at at all in Penrose. And there are issues about not just the destruction of medical and governmental records, uh, the failure to heed legitimate calls for an independent inquiry, but also restrictions on press investigation and reporting, and the use of Crown immunity to prevent investigation of domestic manufacturing processes. One thing we say that the inquiry should be careful of is not indeed also to be blinded by or mired in the science of all this. It can get very easy to be caught up uh, in uh, this as a fascinating uh, issue of uh, responses to unknown uh, viruses uh, and the like. It is always to be remembered that what happened disastrously affected real people. One cannot and should not differentiate between the purely scientific and the pastoral, what happened to patients. And one has to apply, we say, a sceptical, investigative, inquisitorial approach to some of the uh, issues uh, which might be claimed in terms of, well, it was just what was known or practice at the time. For example, risks were known about the possibility of blood-borne infection from pooled products well before uh, the emergence of either non-A, non-B hepatitis or uh, what was then called HT. LV3, which was subsequently HIV. The inquiry, therefore, has to, in, we say, look at the historical context in which therapeutic and political decisions were made. We say there should be a need to always to see things from the patient's uh, perspective. We say that in producing and using its products, the patient should have been at the forefront of NHS decision-making throughout. If ever they were not, that requires to be uncovered. We say that patients should have been and should be informed of their opinions, of their options, and that should count. If that didn't happen, that requires to be stated. We have heard from so many that people were simply not advised about the risks of the blood or the blood products which they were given. Their consent wasn't even thought relevant. There was not informed consent. There was no consent in some ways. Those are issues which this inquiry must look at. The attitude towards patients as people whose consent isn't really required because they're simply the subjects of this therapy, also extended to the failure to inform patients that they were being tested and monitored for the evidence and development of infection. Many were not told that they, were, they had become infected, even when it was with viruses whose transmission pathways were already known. Far from putting their right to know at the forefront, it wasn't even considered to exist. That has to be tackled with by this inquiry. There has to be a need to counter medical complacency. Why was blood sourced and injected into patients and blood products that were taken from foreign paid donors? For example, a whole series of boys with haemophilia who were being treated at York Hill Hospital in Glasgow and uh, so many of them. Uh, developed HIV? Why were local hospitals and individual consultants allowed to continue with treatments long after they'd been abandoned in other parts of the country? Because in those other parts of the country, the risks they posed were thought to be unacceptable. Why did doctors using whole blood for transfusion appear to so, know so little about the risks inherent in the products which they provided 
when it seemed to be common knowledge among the trans transfusionists, they knew that what was being supplied uh, had, uh, was infected. And why were patients who had not received treatment before not afforded the opportunity to benefit from developments in other parts of the country in relation to viral inactivation? In some parts of the country, heat treatment uh, was brought in uh, in terms of, 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 of blood and blood products. But it wasn't done uniformly. So it meant that uh, some were exposed to unsafe uh, blood and unsafe blood products when there was a known method of making them safer, if not completely safe. Why did that happen? That comes down to the need for communication. The issue of lack of communication has been central to the experience of so many whom I represent. Lack of communication between clinicians and parents and patients and their family, lack of communication between the government and the medical profession, as well as between different branches of the profession, between haematologists and those responsible for transfusions in different regional centres and local hospitals, lack of communication between agencies in different parts of the United Kingdom, and lack of communication between professionals uh, with a developed interest in blood and blood products. Clearly, the consequences for those infected and affected has to be understood. The financial consequences are important. They cannot be uh, gainsaid. They cannot be simply sidelined. Uh, the financial uh, consequences uh, which have been suffered have not been compensated for, have not been recognised. Uh, and insofar as have been recognised, derisory sums have been awarded. And even talking about money is thought to be not quite right. There's a recording that was taken as part of an oral history project curated by the Royal College of Physicians into the early days of the AIDS epidemic. There's a recording there of one former consultant hematologist making the following remarks. I mean, cynically. I think the patients, the few patients who are driving this, are probably after money, actually. Those remarks are symptomatic, frankly, of a disgraceful attitude taken by a number of medics who see those like those whom I represent, who are seeking answers, who want redress, as simply being ungrateful for what was done to them and who would now seek to blame them and can continue to stigmatise them because they want to call their doctors to account. That is the kind of attitude which needs to be called out and condemned by this inquiry. We've got a number of procedural experiences from Penrose and expectations we think we can help uh, in how the inquiry might be run. Um, and one has to be realistic about what those procedural expectations are, but we just want to set out a few uh, of those. The first one is, as I've said, those whom I represent are participants, are core participants. They are not going to be sidelined again. They are not going to be silenced. They are not going to be ignored. Many of them, many of them are here, have spent years understanding this phenomenon. They are phenomenal experts. That expertise needs to be called upon by this inquiry. They know so much more. They have lived through this for so many years. Their voices, their expertise, they're willing to give that to this inquiry. This inquiry should take advantage uh, of that. Then there's the role of the lawyers. Um, I have been tasked, I've got the honour to represent these 250 uh, people primarily from Scotland. I've got work to do for them. They've asked me and those lawyers with me, uh, Kirsten and Jamie and the Thompson's team, to 
ensure that, as I say, this inquiry fulfills those expectations and that I'm asked, we are asked, to call it to account. We need to be able to do our work. We want to help the inquiry. We want to assist uh, with uh, counsel uh, to the inquiry. What we don't want is simply again to be treated as uh, sitting passively there and uh, just listening uh, to matters uh, for 40 hours in a week of inquiries or 60 hours and doing nothing and not contributing. This inquiry, if it's to work, if it has to maintain the faith which has been invested in it, has to allow for an active and collaborative approach uh, from uh, the infected and affected through the lawyers who've come here. So, we are aware of our responsibilities. We are not here as the lawyers uh, to simply be out here to make as much money out of this as we can because that's the kind of accusation which is sometimes uh, pressed. We are aware of our responsibilities to the public purse. We will do such work as we need to, as we think is responsible and necessary to further our clients' interests. And we expect those judgments to be respected uh, by the inquiry. Because the essential part is maintaining the trust and confidence of the infected and affected and this inquiry's efforts will come to naught unless it maintains that trust and confidence. So those whom I represent and the way in which I represent them, we have to feel we're getting a fair crack of the whip. And that our designation as core participants is not some nice gesture, an exercise in tokenism. This is their inquiry. They want it to work. They want it to succeed. We want to work with it. So, as I say, we are core participants. We're not passive spectators. We're not officious bystanders. We are here to work with you. As part of that, one of the issues which arose really from the Penrose inquiry was at some point an awful lot of documentation was disclosed, but it was disclosed at very, very short notice, which meant again that although they could say, well, you got all the documents, if you get them two days before uh, the hearing begins on it, then you're not really getting much uh, active participation. So the procedure which is adopted clearly has to allow for proper time, proper consideration uh, with our clients of information as it is uncovered because there will be lines that we wish to push and run for and we need the, the proper time uh, to find those and to substantiate them and push them. And I'm uh, heartened to hear uh, from the uh, Council to Inquiry that, that there will be uh, a very much uh, a proactive approach uh, on those uh, issues, those practical issues. Clearly, the structuring of topics will come up and there are, we'll, we will be feeding in on the inquiry on, on that issue. One of the points we think which may raise in future is the possibility of examination of witnesses directly by or on behalf of the core participants. It may be there are questions which counsel the inquiry uh, thinks, so well, we don't need to ask those. But if we're going to maintain the trust and confidence of the core participants, if the lawyers think they're worth asking, then let us ask them. We want witnesses to be put on oath. All witnesses, I think, really. Um, it's not that uh, some witnesses can just come here and give an account uh, which they uh, can be comfortable with. Uh, everyone, as a matter of course, so that this evidence is compelable and on oath. We want transparency. And one of the issues uh, which has arisen, a practical issue, is this issue about expert panels. And we can understand the idea of expert panels. There's an awful lot of technical matters uh, which 
a myriad of them which will require, as it were, uh, you, sir, to having to, as it were, learn an awful lot. And we can absolutely understand uh, the idea that, that experts uh, assisting you in a teaching, a tutorial and, and the like, is a, is a great way of, of, of doing that. But we still want to be involved in that. Uh, one of the things which you've said is that um, the reports of the groups will be uh, fully open and accessible, and where there are significant disagreements among the experts on the panel, uh, they will be tested and explored and challenged openly in the public hearings. But one of the things that has, has been raised with me is what if the, uh, there is a consensus among the experts and the received wisdom is not one which our clients, in their expertise and knowledge, don't think to be well-founded. Part of the issue is that we've always been fobbed off with a complacency of experts. This is how we do it. What are you, what, who are you to question us? So we, we can see the advantages of expert panels. Uh, we can see where we think it's a good idea that we get to suggest uh, those who might be appointed. We hope also uh, that if there are uh, concerns about some of those who are appointed, that we can raise those and they might uh, be listened to. What about the future? There are a number of issues which we say this inquiry should seek to establish as part of learning from the infected and affected experience. As you say, there is, this has to be an, an opportunity for truth and justice for the infected and affected. Maybe, but just maybe, the possibility of some kind of reconciliation between uh, those responsible for the infections, both from the NHS and government, and those who have suffered. That needs an apology. That needs an acceptance of responsibility. Thus far, certainly post Penrose, we've seen no signs of contrition or regret from the uh, medical establishment or the medical or individuals uh, who have come to that inquiry. Various lessons clearly have to be learned for the future. Uh, one of them is, is stating the obvious, no blood from prisoners. One of the, uh, and no paid for blood. There's always a temptation to source blood and or blood products in the most economically efficient way possible. Uh, but that should not allow for a compromise in safety. Safety has to come first. Part of that we say, part of our recommendations which we'll be arguing for is that uh, positively there might be a safety that this this inquiry uh, might recommend that, that a safety levy be imposed on the large pharmaceutical companies. Because companies which introduce new products and treatments, in a sense, uh, benefit the profit from that uh, uh, if they work. But when they don't work, the cost of uh, that falls on the population as a whole. Those who profit uh, from treatments should be ready to pay for the failures in those treatments. And so therefore we say it would be appropriate that some kind of hypothecated levy uh, be taken as part of the profits of pharmaceutical companies to set up a fund uh, in which can be called upon uh, should ever anything of this sort happen and can be called upon by those who have, have already uh, suffered. A duty of candor it's already now being brought into uh, the law. Uh, there's been changes in legislation to ensure that medical professionals actually involve and, and say and state uh, the, at an early stage, potential risks or problems with treatments uh, 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 past, current or future uh, are identified. We require full patient involvement. Now, all those good standards have come in very, very recently in Scotland, only enforced the duty of candour regulations came into force only on the 1st of April of this year. But it is important, I think, uh, that that legal duty become a reality and that the recommendations focus on that because so much of the anger 
has been because of the lack of candor, the unwillingness to just tell people what's happening. So that is incredibly important. The security and reliability of medical records, I've said often enough that in so many cases, it appears that medical records have been redacted by persons unknown and important information has gone, but also false information has been added in so many cases where part of this culture of blaming the infected and affected, the suggestions have sometimes come in those medical records which have been recovered, uh, that this person must be an intravenous drug user or a secret alcoholic because uh, and they're, not, they're just not owning up uh, to these issues. Those are false. That has to be taken out. So those aspects in terms of medical records, their security and their accuracy are issues which um, are very much at the forefront. Being informed and getting consent about being the subject of medical research studies. We know there are changes in the law with that, but it's important they be underlined. Because one of the attitudes has been that the, in, the infected have been objects of anonymous study and they've not been told. They, their lives have become data sets to be mined. And they didn't know about it. And that's a violation. There was one, two brothers uh, at one of the meetings I was at, who said that they were hemophiliacs, uh, young boys having to come in um, after having been infected but not knowing of their infection, but being the subject of a study. The doctor referred to them as, there's my young pups. They thought it was a term of affection. They thought it was because he liked them. They didn't know it was an acronym for previously uninfected patients. That kind of attitude, once again, that lack of respect, that lack of understanding of patients' integrity, of patients' individuals. Stop classifying me as a subject of your attention. Treat me as an equal. Tell me the truth. Caring for the infected and affected, there's got to be follow-up. There's got to be long-term follow-up by those who've been infected and affected. This is not something which happened once and can then be forgotten and closed off. There are continuing consequences. There's a need for psychosocial report, uh, support. There's a need, as we've said, for full compensation. Full compensation is awarded in Ireland. If it can be done in Ireland, surely, surely we can do it here. We say there should be a lifting of time bars on court actions. That could be part of, a, a, a part of an issue in relation to uh, the full funding, uh, which should be set up. If we can't agree on full funding, then we should be able to uh, at least have the option of opening court actions. There should be a secure stream for funding for the charities who have done such sterling work and have kept this issue alive. And the fact that we're all here is tribute to the work which they did. They have to be supported. And there's got to be recommendations about further medical research. We believe that the inquiry will cover many areas where further medical research is required to understand fully the implications of the contaminated uh, blood disaster for victims. We say that the UK government should establish a research fund to support work in these areas. For example, are there any clinical implications of being repeatedly infected by different genotypes of hepatitis C, or does multiple exposure have an impact on clearing the virus? Is there immune response fatigue? And do the long-term sexual partners of people with an inherited bleeding disorder, disorder who've uh, been exposed to contaminated blood or blood products, do they have an elevated uh, rate of any particular conditions? Those are matters which have yet to be uncovered, have to be researched into. We have our suspicions. These are not simply unfounded issues. So, in conclusion, 
the 250 or so individuals have asked me and the Thompsons team and, and, and Jamie and Kirsten to represent them. We've entered this inquiry process with confidence that it can and the hope that it will deliver on the terms of reference and meet the objectives which are detailed in that statement. The inquiry has got to be about the infected and affected whom we represent and others from around the country. It's they are the people who have to be at the heart of this process in any meaningful way. They are committed, we as their legal representatives are committed to working with the inquiry to ensure that it reaches a positive outcome where so many other investigations, bodies and inquiries have failed. That commitment is based on the legitimate and we hope well-founded expectation that we will find in this inquiry the investigation, the respect, the trust and the fearless honesty which was lacking in so much of our experience to date with other bodies. So can I commend you, sir, for your opening remarks in which you celebrated the fundamental dignity, the perseverance, the sheer courage of the infected and affected. What we have seen to date has given those whom I represent hope and a cautious optimism, which is as much optimism as you're likely to get from Scots. <laughs> so we look forward to working with the inquiry in a fully collaborative and active way with a view to achieving our common objectives of fulfilling the terms of reference, bring justice to those who have died and to those whose lives have been unutterably altered and burdened by this scandal. It's to those lost lives, to those stolen lives, that we commit ourselves. Thank you. Having my, myself grown up in Scotland, uh, I feel honoured to be the recipient of cautious optimism. <laughs> uh, and can I just say, uh, in, uh, in some response, that uh, I believe, uh, as uh, Mr. O'Neill has said, that core participant contains two words, the second of which is participant. And I look forward to all core participants playing a full and contributive part in this inquiry. Our second speaker is the first unrepresented core participant, Della Rhines Hirsch. She just Testing, testing here. Wow, well, I'm going to get my water. Well, I'll introduce myself first. My name is Della Rhines Hirsch. My husband Dan and I had twin sons in 1976, one of whom was diagnosed with haemophilia. Dan and I had met in San Francisco where I was living in the 60s. I mention this because it will have significance later on in the inquiry when I give my evidence. But um, I feel overwhelmed and somewhat disbelieving that after all these long years of struggle and heartache, we, the devastated community, are to finally be able to tell in public before a judge and his advisors the absolutely, unbelievably terrible story of contaminated blood products. 
I'm just going to get my water. Hang on. Some of the wider world my own, might only think of blood products being just for those with haemophilia, like our son, who died at the age of 35, leaving a loving partner of 12 years and their baby of 10 months old. But as we all know now, contaminated products found their way outside that cohort and managed to kill that young mother having her first baby and needing a small transfusion, that road accident victim run over by some careless speeding driver, those women having relationships with their husbands or partners, and all the myriad ways that other people became infected. So I was so moved to see yesterday the wonderful expression of all that has happened in our community that had been put together by the committee. It showed through film and music and speech and wonderful photos, including one of our son. The truly horrendous wrong that has been visited on us. So how did this all happen? And when did the medical profession know? And what made them continue to use these products for many years after contamination was both suspected and realized. I was asked to comment on the inquiry's terms of reference. And now having read and reread these terms that they have put together, I would say that they do cover many of the areas about which we would all like to know more. One area that definitely needs a stronger and harder light shone on it mentioned by the previous speaker, is exactly why so many in the medical and allied professions not only did not share their suspicions, but not even when they knew, had real knowledge of what was happening, but at the same time made it impossible for any of their clients, us, to ask questions or raise doubts. It is now quite clear that many doctors and others involved in the medical field did know that the treatment they were using was suspect. In my local paper, I live in London, in Highgate, the Ham and High last week, the front page was completely given over to an article about a well-known professor, head of a haemophilia center, stating that she knew, and I quote, that everyone in her haemophilia unit would get hepatitis C. That will come back later in my evidence because I had a quite a lot of interaction there. Whilst another haemophilia centre head talking on a panel on Radio 4 some months ago that Dan and I were listening to became irate when being challenged on this subject. So it would be my suggestion that had both the medical profession and all of the others, and here we might mention the Department of Health, who were involved in blood product treatment, were engaged in what I call a complicity of silence, and therefore did not call out their suspicions and their anxieties about this for years. And this led, I believe, to the long, long delay in looking for new ways to produce safe alternatives. And we also cannot forget the 